morning, everyone. Um, welcome to my session. Um, I'm Shima from eBay, and it's such an honor to be back in Shanghai again to um, uh, talk about uh, our Kubernetes cool projects. And um, thank you all for attending. Today, I'm going to talk about how we build and manage Kubernetes with Kubernetes, uh, which is basically our eBay's fleet management system and the way we run our private cloud with Kubernetes and GitOps. So this is the agenda. I'm going to give a very quick introduction first on eBay's Kubernetes deployments. And after that, I'm going to introduce our fleet management system based on Kubernetes uh, that builds and runs our private cloud. Uh, in a deeper dive of that system, I'm going to walk through the way uh, we build um, and manage IAS with Kubernetes. Basically, we build uh, compute providers based on Kubernetes and how we build um, eBay's Kubernetes clusters uh, with our salt operators and controllers. And in the end, uh, I'm going to uh, share our GitOps practices to run our fleet and lots of our uh, cool features inspired by Kubernetes. Uh, first things first, um, eBay is one of the earlier adopter of Kubernetes. We started since 2015. Uh, we run an internal distribution called Test.io. Uh, within the past few years, we've moved massive production workloads into containers running on Kubernetes. As of now, we have uh, 50 plus production clusters. Uh, we run multiple VPCs for different environments. Uh, we have both flat network and overlay network based on OVN. Uh, and we have multiple 2,000 plus sized uh, clusters with heavy production workloads. Uh, for now, we have roughly uh, 160,000 pods uh, running on about 30,000 hosts. Most of them are bare metals because we only run bare metals for uh, production. Uh, we have so many different kinds of workloads running on Kubernetes now. We have our uh, web services for sure. We have databases, search engines. We have uh, Hadoop and AI and machine learnings as well. Uh, in the past uh, European KubeCon, I had a talk about our practices to run high-performance workloads and our performance training. If you are interested, you can always find the slides online and the presentation as well. Uh, we are also running on the edge. We have around like 20, actually 15, uh, edge uh, clusters across the world. And we are running our uh, Envoy edge proxies as well as software load balancers on top of Kubernetes there, where we do a lot of uh, SSL termination, uh, web caching to uh, accelerate our remote eBay users' user experience. Uh, we are rapidly growing our footprint on the edge as well. So our ultimate goal is to unify our fleet with Kubernetes, and we are trying our best to get there. Um, so now, after getting some idea on eBay's Kubernetes footprint, um, you might wonder, how did we get there? And the short answer is we use Kubernetes to make it all happen. And that is, what, that is our fleet management system to build and manage eBay's private cloud that runs Kubernetes with Kubernetes. Uh, as most of you know that Kubernetes is not just a container platform. It is a uh, portable system that can be used to do many different things in many different ways. Uh, we use it to manage and build our private cloud. Uh, that is our fleet management system. Same as many other Kubernetes services, our system runs with API server and its CD cluster. In eBay, we automated this process so that you can spin off a few pods and create uh, an API server and its CD with uh, its CD operator. You can run them in a single cluster or run like multiple uh, clusters as a uh, HA setup. Once you have the API setup, we create a lot of CRDs, which is the fun part, uh, which is the modeling. And we uh, model m almost everything and every anything. So from hardware, which we uh, model our entire data center, from racks to switches to VPC stuff, NAS routes, and eventually compute assets, where we can provision hosts from. And we are also touching base on the software stack. Uh, we start from operating system, and we model compute nodes, and we build Kubernetes with salt, so we model the whole salt stack as well. So um, it pretty much covers from infrastructure to application and from hardware to software. So once you have all those CRDs and models, you write a lot of controllers. Uh, we write like provisioning controllers that provision compute nodes, just like creating Kubernetes is creating pods. And the notebook controller will create um, a set of compute nodes with the exact same setup of uh, config. Uh, and we support multiple providers, uh, and we have a building uh, homegrown provisioning system. 
that I'm going to talk about later. And then we have a very powerful salt operator that can build Kubernetes with uh, salt. Uh, we can install salt master on a compute node from a git commit ID. And then you can build a cluster out of it. Um, and we have salt deployments and a few other uh, controllers to manage a set of uh, salt minions so that you can run multiple Kubernetes masters and uh, Q Kubernetes nodes. We have many other controllers as well. For example, like Rack controllers, which takes care of the bootstrapping. We have the scheduler. We have IPAN to do IP allocation. And of course, DNS controllers and uh, remediation controllers that takes care of the compute nodes uh, lifecycle management. And with all those controllers and models, we have um, many functions that we are inspired by Kubernetes. For example, we have transactions, rolling updates, and disruption budgets, and all kinds of stuff. So this is a typical model-driven automation. This is the way we think we can use to unify eBay's fleet with Kubernetes. Um, OK, let's get to the architecture view of a single availability zones fleet management system deployment together with their models. Uh, so here is the API server and its CD. And then you have a test master, which is a set of many, many controllers that's run, running on top of this API server. And then what's inside that API server from the left side, you can see there are a lot of IAS bits. For example, hardwares, racks. And then from the uh, right side, you can see there are a lot of uh, Kubernetes bits. For example, salt and uh, Kubernetes nodes. Um, the fun part is that uh, the whole fleet management system is also running inside a Kubernetes cluster that it builds. So you can build a new availability zone from external cluster that manage this uh, new availability zone to build the new clusters. And then after that, you can migrate the whole thing inside that um, availability zone so that it's self-contained. Um, it's, it's funny that you can have like the building blocks running inside a cluster that it built. So next, I'm going to uh, take a deeper dive onto both IAS part and uh, Kubernetes part to see how we manage them with the same fleet management system. Um, first, let's zoom in into the IAS layer to see how we build and manage it. So Kubernetes needs compute uh, from providers. Uh, we have um, different providers, for example, uh, OpenStack as a private cloud provider and GCP as a public cloud provider. Um, and then our fleet management system uh, needs to define interfaces from our controllers to uh, work with those uh, providers. So for example, a typical example is a provisioning controller would define the interfaces to create, delete, and re-image computes. And then different providers, clients, will implement those uh, interfaces. Uh, we support OpenStack and GCP for now. And as many of you know that um, eBay used to be a huge uh, OpenStack shop. Our first few Kubernetes clusters are running on Kubernetes, uh, sorry, OpenStack as well. Uh, but once we are running more and more production workloads, we are trying to run most of our stuff on bare metals. And we start to think, why not building a bare metal compute provider by ourselves? Um, so that we can get rid of all the complexity from OpenStack, uh, so that we don't need to deal with all, all so many different components, and especially RapidMQ. And that thought is driving us to build a homegrown web metal provisioning system to do simple stuff. So we do like uh, kickstart and preceding, uh, uh, and it's a, it's a Kubernetes system. And it's, it's a provider for our fleet management system uh, so that it can build bare metals uh, within itself. It's self-contained, is highly scaled. And once we do that, we start to create CRDs for all the data center bits. And then that inspired us to move for, further to manage and orchestrate the fleet, which means that we're going to model the entire data center. And it empowered us to do many other things. For example, manage the compute nodes lifecycle. For example, you can do remediation. You can uh, do cleanups. And, and you can you know serve as a CMDB as well, because many of your objects are already in Kubernetes. And, and eventually, after we have bare metal clusters built out, we, have, uh, we still miss VMs, because uh, not everything is in container for us. Uh, we still have Windows workloads, and how do you deal with that? And, and that's how we start to think, why not just to build a VM provider with Kubernetes as well, so that we can take VMs from those Kubernetes clusters. Uh, and for that, we use uh, 
So this is an overview of our um, IS layer to be managed by Kubernetes. I mostly focus on the compute bits. Um, so uh, let's zoom in now and start from get go. So this is a life cycle um, of a typical eBay production server's life cycle. Uh, in our private data center, once a new rack is landed and powered on, uh, all the assets would uh, find a DHCP server from Switch's DHCP helper uh, and get an IP and DHCP find the next server to TFTP and we have a default IPXC so that it gets a pixie boot image and from that pixie boot image we have um, a startup job to pull a git repo to do a lot of bootstrapping jobs for example set up the BMCs and uh, do some sort of discovery so that we uh, know all the um, bad battle specs, for example, serial numbers and uh, uh, asset tags, racks, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this will send the whole thing as a payload to Foreman. Foreman is a server's lifecycle management system that connects the provisioning system with DFTP, uh, TFTP and DHCP, and it provides a Pixie and uh, HTTP infrastructure for your installation. So once it's sent to Foreman, Foreman is going to send it to our registration system that populates a CMDB. And then our fleet management system can kick in and do the model of the rack. So our data center modeling is based on a rack unit. Uh, from a rack, we can see all the subnets from that rack, and then the routes, the, uh, the L2 domains, the uh, IP addresses, and eventually uh, the compute assets. So this is the, uh, well, it's a little bit small, but um, this is the uh, compute asset object. You can see there's BNC IPs and ETH0 MAC addresses and uh, manufacturer serial numbers, all kinds of stuff so that you can use later to provision bare metal hosts. So once the whole thing is modeled, um, uh, we have the assets and subnets, right? Uh, they are CRDs and objects in API server. We can provision hosts. Uh, in the previous slides, we modeled Foreman. Foreman is also serving here as our uh, TFTP and HTTP service so that um, you know, unlike any traditional provisioning system where you send like a massive um, payload into uh, an API, you just create a compute node object in um, API server, and it's pretty much on the uh, on this side. You create the compute node with the OS image. Uh, we use uh, CentOS Atomic, and then you specify a flavor. Flavor is an object that we created to tell uh, controllers to automatically generate a kickstart snippet uh, to partition the disks. And then you have the specs for the asset selector um, based on the hardware or specific functions. And once you create the compute node, scheduler starts to look for the free assets and it's gonna um, fill in the status field as well as an annotation and specs to uh, allocate a specific assets, uh, asset. And after that, uh, IP allocation will start working on it. So it's subscribe on the specific asset tag from the object uh, and find its network zone, which is basically the VPC. You can see here my network zone is uh, production. And it's gonna find the asset, find its subnet uh, from, the uh, from the rack and the switch. And it's gonna pick the production subnet and then find an IP from that specific subnet. And then it's gonna annotate and uh, putting to the compute node spec so that the next controller will start working on the specific provisioning, which is the major provisioning controller, which, ta which takes the specific uh, computer, compute node and create a form and host. Um, and it, in the middle of that, it also automatically generates the uh, partitioning bits there so that it can tell uh, how do I partition the disks. For example, I have three disks. I need to set up LVM. I need to set up MDADM. So the whole thing you can model from a CRD and then our controller will automatically generate and populate that. So basically controllers work, uh, works in order. So they subscribe to different fields of the compute node objects. And it also puts uh, finalizers uh, into the compute node object so that when you delete the compute node, for example, DNS controller will see, okay, I put on a specific finalizer for DNS. So I'm gonna remove DNS as well. IP allocation will release the IP, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole provisioning system, it works like this. It's completely declarative, and then you know each stage you can track from the status and uh, you know of the compute node object. So now um, 
it pretty much covers the provisioning bits and you can provision bare metal hosts. Uh, we start to think about how do we run virtual machines, right? So let's assume you have uh, bare metal provisioned and you have a bare metal only Kubernetes cluster. Well, we jumped a little bit, but uh, we are wondering if we can get VMs for our, for example, Windows workloads, right? To let Windows only run on virtual machines running on top of Kubernetes. So basically, VM on Kubernetes has uh, two major uh, technology. First is Kata Container. It's super popular. I'm pretty sure most of you already uh, heard of that. So it's pretty much running native and secure workloads in Kubernetes. Um, and then there is uh, pure virtual machine solutions like uh, Marantes' uh, Bertlet and uh, Red Hat's uh, Kubert. So we pretty much do both. So we use Kata as well to run our um, uh, Kata is a Kata is a runtime for us for our secure workloads, so that you have a, a very quick um, virtual machine spin-off for the specific secure part you want to uh, run, and then the Kata agent inside the VM will create the container and parts for you. Uh, we use Kata for our secure workloads, but uh, Kata is not easy. At least to me, it's not so easy to be used as a VM provider to get VM computes. That's why we explored on some other solutions and we eventually picked up uh, Vertlet. So Vertlet is, um, a compu is our computer provider. You can create a pod in a specific uh, Kubernetes cluster and it's gonna get you a virtual machine. So basically, uh, VM is created as a pod. Um, and that's only for our non-container workloads, um, like Windows, just as I mentioned many times. Um, so basically, we can deploy any QCOW2 image that we use to run in OpenStack. And, and, and it's best for non-containers that we have. And then you can just uh, throw it in and then run it in our uh, fleet management system as well. By embedding Vertlet as our VM provider, um, we can build a Kubernetes cluster on top of a Kubernetes cluster, which is the fun part, right? So you have the VM as your um, compute provider and then you can build a VM Kubernetes cluster on top of a bare metal Kubernetes cluster. And that's super useful for us so, because we want to use a lot of CI CDs. We do a lot of end-to-end -end testings because we run our own distribution of Kubernetes. And, and this is pretty much a uh, compute node. Actually, this is a node pool spec for Vertlet. You can only see the difference between this one and a uh, specific Bare metal compute node is that it's way shorter. It doesn't have all the flavor bits. All it has is a um, VM flavor from our Kubernetes clusters. And then we also have the provider equals to Vertlet uh, together with other bits like SSH keys and stuff. And it's gonna create a pod in Kubernetes cluster like this. And this one will create a virtual machine for us. Uh, we worked on a few areas like uh, config drive and cloud in it, but eventually we can get virtual machines from Kubernetes. So now we have all those computes. Uh, we are going to build Kubernetes clusters. So we build Kubernetes uh, with salt. Uh, since we are a Kubernetes system, we start with model and uh, uh, CRDs, right? So we start to model the salt stack. Um, so we have salt master and salt minions. Uh, that are both objects managed by salt deployments, uh, which create and orchestrate on both objects. So a salt master will take a commit ID from a salt git repo and set up a salt master that's later gonna be used to deploy Kubernetes. And then we have different other salt deployments, for example, like um, masters salt deployment to run uh, salt high states with a masters role, and we have the Cube nodes, uh, salt deployments to run uh, the cube nodes so that you can run kubelet and kube, uh, kube proxy. And then we have other features just that I mentioned like salt transactions that takes care of rolling updates because we are running like a huge cluster, uh, 3,000 nodes. You cannot run the updates at the one shot everywhere. You have to stage it, right? So we support rolling updates. We created this feature inspired by Kubernetes, which is called transactions, it's gonna break the node pools, compute nodes, into different buckets based on the uh, strategy that you specify. We can do node by node, rack by rack, and many others. You can even plug in your own uh, strategy 
so that we can put the compute nodes into buckets and then run them stage by stage. Uh, that's our transaction. After that, we have uh, controllers. We have a lot of salt controllers, and this is the breakdown of that. So basically, a salt deployment is a one-to-one -one mapping to a node pool. If you remember, the node pool is a set of compute nodes that we provisioned that has the same spec of uh, operating system and, and host config. And then uh, salt master deployments will take a specific commit ID from Git and then deploy a specific salt master that's going to be deploying our uh, Kubernetes. This is the uh, first one here, salt master. And then we have the role equals to master salt deployment here that's going to deploy the Kubernetes masters. Basically, they are setting the role and grants and computers on the specific nodes and then run salt high state so that uh, they can install API server and etcd one by one. We fix the dependency for the etcd cluster and uh, from the salt state. And it also has the salt transactions here. So once it has a salt transaction defined, the salt deployments will create the salt minions objects one by one because mostly for master nodes, we're going to do one by one for both setting up and, and, and upgrades. And then you're going to see different purposes of uh, 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 Kubernetes nodes. Uh, we have delegations, we have different workloads so that you can uh, set up the remaining Kubernetes nodes. So on the right side, you're going to see there are a lot of controllers. We have uh, different operators that does uh, different things. For example, salt deployment controller will create the salt transactions based on the rolling app strategy. And we have auto resume controller that's basically doing buckets by buckets automatically based on the very important health, health monitor framework, which we also took from Kubernetes. So each bucket will check um, the props and conditions to make sure that is ready uh, and then move on to the next one. So by doing that, you can take a salt deployment, uh, not one, but a set of salt deployment objects and then roll the whole cluster for both setting up and upgrades. So this is an example of the salt deployment object that we have. Uh, well, it's a little bit too small, sorry. Um, you have pretty much the git repo here. There's a git commit ID. And then you have the uh, salt uh, master setup bits and the salt minion setup bits so that you can uh, know specifically from git commit ID on which um, Kubernetes version you're running and your code base is on what. So this is, again, very declarative and how we run our Kubernetes clusters. So, okay, now we have pretty much gone through the functional bits of our fleet management system. If you follow through, there are a lot of objects and a lot of CRDs. And, and you can almost tell that every bit can be put into Git. And then we can run GitOps, like out of the box. So let's take a wider view from bottoms up. So we run our operating system and we build our own operating system uh, using OS3. So operating system can be built from a JSON spec and then it's gonna build a tree and you have a commit ID that represents the whole operating system's footprint. And then we have a provisioning system uh, which create a lot of CRDs and we have a lot of controllers to create them uh, to provision the bare metal hosts. And then you have salt to install and config Kubernetes. And then if you checking all those um, CRDs into Git, you can run GitOps. And of course, I missed one part here, which is the compute and cluster lifecycle management. We manage the remediation policies from compute node as well. So pretty much you can have everything check into Git so that you have the whole fleet in Git. Part of that is the CRDs. The other part is your state, uh, your code. And you can connect things together with two or three Git repos and you can make everything to be in Git. So that our way of doing things is GitOps for DevOps. So you have a PR-driven operations and with everything declarative. And that's the way we build and scale our Kubernetes footprints in eBay so that you can build consistent and highly scalable uh, clusters across the world for eBay. So that's pretty much the GitOps part. And the last I'm going to talk about our features inspired by Kubernetes. We have a lot of features inspired by Kubernetes. Uh, we don't have much time left. 
but I'm gonna quickly go through them. So scheduler is uh, similar as our scheduler is similar as cube scheduler. It's gonna pick some free assets based on your selector and enter affinity affinity selector. It's gonna pick the uh, pick the asset and we talk many times about the rolling updates we build transactions and buckets and strategies uh, which is pluggable and then we have uh, destruction budgets so that you can limit from a specific namespace of a cluster to see how many nodes you can delete reimage uh, within a day within an hour that's something we took from the pod disruption budget and we use it from our host and for our upgrades and host our uh, release and as well as OS upgrades and then we have the health monitor framework, which is also inspired by Kubernetes. We put a lot of props for our um, uh, compute nodes. Uh, there are a lot of conditions. And then uh, the compute nodes liveness prop and readiness prop is a major driven point for our remediation controller with which we can manage our um, Kubernetes clusters lifecycle. And then uh, pretty much we have many other things that we didn't list here. but. Thanks to Kubernetes, that's how it's possible for us to manage our fleet with a declarative system like this, to make it our, our life easier. So last is the summary. So pretty much everything is covered. Uh, I just want to say that the, um, with the scale and the kind of footprint we are running with Kubernetes, we need a lot of help. So we have a great China team here in Shanghai. So if you are interested, please directly engage with our folks here. I have the barcode here. Thank you so much, uh, Q&A. No questions? Oh. Uh, so, uh, if, so a few years ago in the, I think the Boston OpenStack Summit, we, uh, it mentioned about the open source version, but I think later we're building too many uh, eBay logics onto it, so there's no plan to open source it yet. The major driven for this talk is to uh, go through the ideas of um, how do you use a Kubernetes system to manage a large um, uh, clusters like eBay is running us. Yeah, uh, I mean, even for the small pieces of the code, some small components like Remdation controller or something. Uh, not, not I'm aware of as of now. We have some other stuff that we are planning on open source, like uh, the visualization bits. We have a um, uh, plugin that we can uh, visualize the whole CRDs and the data center that we are trying to um, work with the uh, CNCF to uh, open source that. But I don't have any specific things yet. If you are interested, please directly connect with me. Um, I can answer any questions. Okay, it's quite a day. Thank you.